But let me go ahead and introduce you to your host today. My name is Olivia Richardson. I'm one of the sales directors here, executive sales directors here at Senior Marketing Specialist. But today, who the real star is, is actually our own key accounts manager and um, our compliance officer for the entire building, for McNerney Manager Group, not just for Senior Marketing Specialist, Mr. Chaylen Jackson. So good morning, Chaylen. Good morning, Olivia. So tell me a little bit, again, I know we kind of started this, but why... Let me, let me ask you this. Why is compliance so incredibly important in general, but going into AEP? I think, you know, when we look at the way most agents operate and the volume of business during an AEP, mm -hmm. the speed at which agents are working and right. just the, the number of clients they're seeing, it's those simple mistakes that can really trip agents up. Sure. And the worst part is we a lot of times won't find out for a couple months after it actually happens. Yeah. So because of that, compliance, obviously important year round, mm -hmm. important to look at now as a way to prevent those pitfalls and those little mistakes during AEP when you're just kind of on autopilot. Oh, for sure. And that's a huge point. Let's kind of get into it here. Huge growth. Why are we talking about, and we did this in 2020. Yep. We're, and I think even more, you know, continuing to see this into the 2021, going into 2022 AEP. Yeah. What's going on in virtual sales right now? Huge explosion in growth. Yeah. There are so many people getting into virtual sales. There's a huge growth in call centers. All the carriers told us we had record numbers of new call centers opening up. Wow. But your average Main Street agent mm -hmm. with a brick and mortar office, a lot of them followed suit. Mm -hmm. We saw so many of them picking up phone sales, picking up virtual technology provided by the carriers to better serve those clients that had health concerns that couldn't get out of the house, that just preferred to do business over the phone. Sure. Looking at a lot of the research out there, a lot of clients do like doing business over the phone. You'll always have clients that want to come down, sit in the office, mm -hmm. shake hands. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people love that convenience of being able to do things sure. with a phone call and an email. Sure. So because of that, the carriers launched a lot of new processes, different voice signature options, mm -hmm. different online enrollment tools, and upgraded a lot of things that were already in place, which means that there were a lot of chances for mistakes with all these new systems. Sure. I mean, like you said earlier, it's, it's, it's not malicious. It's just growth. It's it's growing pains of I've never done this before. Now I have to learn it overnight, implement Absolutely. it in a hectic time of year. So yeah, mistakes and balls will get dropped. And I think the, you know, the unfortunate side is like any industry, there absolutely are some bad actors out there <laughs> and, you know, just folks that are, are out to make that quick buck and don't really care as much about the client. Any industry has those. Ours is no exception. And unfortunately, the way that most consumers were kind of forced into working digitally, working over the phone during the pandemic last year means that those bad actors had more access to your clients than mm -hmm. they have ever had before. Yeah, I, I read bad actors and I thought we were talking about Joe Namath. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Namath ads because of again people being at home and and, yeah. the, and the convenience of virtual sales. Joe Namath killed it last year Absolutely. as far as marketing sales go. So I think that's huge. One thing to consider as well is that COVID nineteen, all COVID nineteen being in twenty twenty one AEP, which just speed up our industry. Yep. This is the way all industries are going: is virtual options, non face to face sales, using these systems and processes. Senior marketing or the senior market was always kind of slow yep. in that field. COVID-19 didn't make it happen. It just made it happen quicker. Yeah. Yeah. I think it forced a lot of people to either adopt or get mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've had e-apps for several years, not to say they couldn't use improvements even right. now. Right. But we've had e-apps. People have been going towards e-apps and the pandemic definitely saw folks forced into learning those new tools right. or stepping back and saying, okay, I've got to hand this off to someone who knows what they're doing. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It definitely, again, it was like you mentioned, it was either adopt or fail. Yeah. And I think a lot of agents are going in with, we're going into the 2022 AEP thinking like, well, this year will be different. I'll get back to face to face and kind of seeing that may not be the case, regardless of COVID or not, people like the virtual option. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of factors at play. We saw mm -hmm. so many of those new call centers stop right. up. Uh, and you know, like any new business, you know, new businesses have around a 90% failure rate, which right. means a lot of those call centers that signed up hundreds, thousands of clients mm -hmm. have now orphaned those clients because yeah. a year in, they're not in business anymore. Yeah, so you've point. got a lot of people who are comfortable working over the phone. That's how they bought last year. 
they may be looking for a new home this year because mm -hmm. their agent's no longer in business. Mm -hmm. The other side of that is you've got some folks who were burned working over the phone last year yeah, that's true. with some of those bad actors and looking for that face-to-face -face interaction. So like with most things, it's going to be a balance. Yeah. So let's go ahead and break into exactly what this is, the compliance. What does compliance look like over the phone? And something where a lot of agents kind of like, hey, you're taking away my paper. You're taking away... Sure. what I can give it and holding things on file, there was a lot of confusion about this document retention. Yeah. And honestly, it was all around the scope of appointment, but that's not, you know, the scope of appointments aren't the only safe thing from that document retention. Yep. And I think that's a common misconception. Mm -hmm. Agents, you know, we get a lot of calls, a lot of questions about scopes of appointments. Sure. When, how, how long, mm -hmm. all of those things. And most agents at this point know, keep it for 10 years. Right but that's absolutely not the only thing you need sure, to keep. Sure, sure. So I think that uh, that's a really common misconception. You need to be keeping those business reply cards. If you do um, a direct mail drop, mm -hmm. keep all those cards for 10 years, mm -hmm. whether you write them or not, because that may be someone you come back to down the road that may be right. And you kind of have to look at it where every lead card you get in mm -hmm. is a potential sale, but also a potential compliance issue. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if there ever was a complaint involving that case, mm -hmm. one of the first things the carrier is going to ask for is, how did you get permission to contact? Sure, sure. And having that business reply card, that lead card, online form on your website, whatever the case may be, that's how you're going to back up that information. Yeah, it's, it's physical proof. What what proof is like, you know, and it, it's how does this protect me? It's not something that yeah. like the carrier is going to come after you for. It's, it's what can I keep on record that is going to protect me? And just keeping this in mind as well, I know we're talking a little bit about if there is a violation, if there is yeah. a compliance issue, but it's not going to be CMS calling an agent Absolutely. and saying, hey, you messed up here, or CMS saying, hey, we're going to do an audit of your book of business. CMS isn't going to ever work directly with the agent. No. Um, At it's the point going, in time that CMS is coming after you as an individual, it might be a good time to leave the country. Yeah, I mean, right, exactly. Right. They ask, ask questions. Um, so it's going to be, again, the carriers can basically perform audits up to 10 years in the past. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Absolutely. And, you know, that last point there that we'll keep on with mm -hmm. um, is those call recordings. If mm -hmm. you're selling over the phone, I highly, highly recommend, whether through your phone provider, through a third-party app, through mm -hmm. something, be recording those calls. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely a great thing to keep on file, to be able to prove how that enrollment happened, what the call content was. Um, it, it very much saves you from that unfortunate he said, she said situation down the road if there is ever a complaint. Now, I do know there is some, call, some questions about like call centers versus virtual agencies. Sure. And there is definitely, you know, just to kind of clear some things up, the carriers will treat two of them differently. If you are an actual call center, and again, this is your contracted, you're registered, that carrier recognizes you as a call center. This is a different conversation. You have, you are required to do call recordings. You're required to turn in scripts, utilizing scripts, utilizing basically these big playbooks. When it comes to a virtual agent, you're not doing the big calls. You're not doing, again, you're not reaching out to thousands of people a day and selling hundreds of policies, when it comes to a one-off virtual agent, call recording is not necessarily required in this sense, but like Chaley mentioned, yeah. it is worth the investment for multiple reasons. Absolutely. So moving on. So where do these complaints come from? I think a lot of agents get it in their head um, when they have a complaint. It, it's, oh, well, that client, they love me. That client, they yeah. love me. I have no idea what they're talking about. This is a lie. I mean, they immediately get up in arms or they start pointing fingers of, well, this agent down the street, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So kind of tell us exactly where can people, where are the most common complaints actually originating from? Yep. So it says it right there on the screen, mm -hmm. three main places the complaints come from, clients being probably the largest one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the big thing for folks to remember is what is a complaint. Right. And sometimes it's an actual complaint where someone says, hey, I want to file a grievance. There's a problem. No one's fixing it. No one's helping me. What can I do? Yeah. Um, sometimes it's client calling 1-800-Medicare to ask a question about their drug coverage when mm -hmm. they should have called you. 
Mm-hmm. So it, it's always best to look at a complaint as an administrative process. Yeah. It's a system that things have to go through mm-hmm. once it gets back to that carrier. Now, I know one of the most common client complaints is exactly what you talked about. It's completely like the client isn't upset. Yep. The client's not mad. What the client does is, oh, I, I have United Healthcare. I can't remember what my copay is. I, yep. I'm going to the doctor. I don't remember that is. I'm going to call the number on the back of my card and ask about this copay. The carrier can view that as a complaint because the carrier assumes the agent did not go into detail or not discuss that. Even though the client just doesn't remember, the carrier assumes that there is that the agent did not do their job. Absolutely. So that's why we always recommend make sure that you are your client's first call every time. And you can sell it. You don't have to call that 1-800 number with United Healthcare. You call me, you call my office. We'll get you taken care of. Absolutely. So all of this. Care- oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I guess roll right into yeah, caretakers. Yeah, care- caretakers. That kind of that surprises me. What's going on with caretakers? Yep. So a lot of times, you know, especially with our senior clients, they may have children, spouses, siblings, mm-hmm. neighbors mm-hmm. helping take care of their day to day needs. Sure. And it's not all that uncommon to pull up a complaint or look through a file and see where that caretaker helped the client file the complaint and is even mentioned in the complaint. So it's not necessarily strictly someone who has power of attorney. Mm -hmm. It could just be a concerned child saying, hey, I take mom to all our doctor's appointments and all of a sudden their copay changed. What happened? Yeah. Why did this change? And especially if mom doesn't remember. Mm -hmm. um, If she has a caregiver, there's something going on there. Absolutely. So it's it's just something to watch out for. And we'll talk about kind of avoiding complaints here in a few slides. Mm -hmm. But um, caretakers absolutely can help file complaints on behalf of those beneficiaries. Beneficiary just has to be on the line with them. Got it. And then I'd say probably the one and only really malicious complaint is going to be those other agents. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that can take a lot of forms, you know. Uh, and I wouldn't even always consider it malicious. What mm-hmm. what we all have to realize is at the end of the day, if you're writing someone and they're not brand new to Medicare, mm-hmm. you're taking a client away from another agent. Sure. That doesn't mean that agent was a bad agent. They could have been. Mm-hmm. But as far as that agent's concerned, you just took away one of their clients. You have sure. to be the bad guy. Sure. So it's not at all uncommon for mm-hmm. another agent to help that client file the complaint. Now, the agent's not going to file a complaint just by themselves mm-hmm. for a client issue. That client's still going to have to file it, but not uncommon at all to see an agent help a client file a complaint because in some cases, they're you know those bad actors will put someone in an inappropriate plan. Yeah, a lot of what I think we hear about is going to be like, oh, this person's marketing this way, this person is doing unfiled, you know, events. That's where I hear a lot of agents actually talk about the complaints. I don't know, you know, how many of those actually get filed, but keep in mind, again, these these complaints are handled on the carrier level. These complaints are not going to be handled. No one's calling up CMS and complaining about some agent's advertising tactics. All of these are done through the carrier level. And so the, the CMS makes the rules, but the carriers are there to more so enforce those. Absolutely. Um, so I know Terry had a question going back to uh, going back to about the Joe Namath stuff, asking how can a company with Joe Namath call themselves Medicare in the title? So just keep in mind here, when it comes to compliance, compliance ad- addresses agent titles, compliance addressed um, uh, basically what, how an agent refers to themselves. They have to have specific agency titles. Names of organizations, websites, things like that have a lot less regulation. Also keep in mind, the company that Joe Namath works for is not an insurance company. It's a lead generating organization. So they are not held to the same standards as insurance carriers because, again, insurance carriers are the ones who, who, uh, who facilitate that. Insurance carriers are the ones that keep us honest. They are not, they don't work with insurance carriers, so there's nobody there to keep them honest for, for a, yep. a lack of a better way of saying it. Yeah, that. it's really a jurisdiction issue. Mm-hmm. You know, if that if if that agency, that ad agency running those commercials doesn't have a license and isn't mm-hmm. contracted with a carrier, there's really not a mechanism for CMS to step in and do anything. Exactly, because they work you with know, the carriers. There's always a lot of talks about, you know, kind of pushing the carriers to create a blacklist Mm -hmm. of, you know, non-compliant ads and Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, But obviously a difficult, long process. 
So it's just a lot about kind of that jurisdictional. You know, if you ever do see something you feel is truly egregious, um, you know, the FTC, the Fair Trade Commission, would be the place to file that mm -hmm. kind of complaint. They do deal with things like dishonest or misleading advertising. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just a jurisdictional issue. Sure. And again, it's all about um, something we talked about I, a couple of years ago at the sales summit. I did a, a conversation on just loving your competition and yeah. where do you want to spend your energy? Do you want to spend your energy with the blowing of the people or improving your marketing efforts? Now, if you know of somebody threatening to break hips, yeah. different conversation. Let's sure. have a conversation about an agent abusing their their people. But uh, but I, in most cases, that's not what's actually going on. Absolutely. So let's move on. We talked about this. What are the most, and I think this is where a lot of agents will be shocked, but the sure. most common types of complaints that we get. Yeah. And by, by far, and these, these top two categories make up, depending on the week, 70 to 85%. Yeah. Because keep in mind here, Chaylin, anytime an agent of ours has a compliance violation, it doesn't matter if there's any direct to us or there are five downlines down, five okay. agents down from a downline with us. Chalen gets all of those complaints. So again, we work yep. with 10,000 agents nationwide. Chalen is definitely the source yep. to know what are the most common complaints that we hear about. Well, we actually get even better data from than that because some of the carriers, well, obviously I can't see the agents involved, but they'll send out weekly reports on their entire distribution channel wow. and what the different complaint types are. Got so it. looking at the entire channel, by far top two are no recollection of enrollment mm -hmm. and agent policy violations. Yeah. So that covers a lot. No recollection of enrollment is pretty, pretty easy to understand. It's either I don't remember changing plans. I didn't tell me they could, I didn't tell them they could sign me up. Mm -hmm. um, I told them I just wanted to shop. I just wanted to look at some benefits. I thought I was signing up for this and mm -hmm. that's not what I got that's what a lot of those types of complaints are. And most weeks that makes up 40 to 50% of the total complaints. Now the no recollection, do you find that it's more of somebody is like agreeing? And let me just ask it this way. Sure. What I hear most about is people saying, oh, they mentioned some drug program. They signed me up for a drug program. I didn't realize I was signing up for a prescription drug plan. Yep. It's That is much more common than somebody is senile and they just genuinely don't they just didn't know or don't remember the entire interaction. Yep, absolutely. A lot of it is that not understanding exactly what they're doing or not understanding what the agent's asking them. So it's it's always absolutely vital to be extremely clear. And you know, I know especially if you've been in sales a long time, mm -hmm. there's a lot of creative ways to ask for that sale. Mm -hmm. Don't get creative. Don't just be like, creative. Like ask yeah, like, <laughs> directly and clearly state what you are asking them to do because especially working with seniors especially working over the phone there's a lot that can get lost in translation you don't have body language to look at you mm -hmm. don't have nonverbal cues to look mm -hmm. at it's all what you two are saying to each other so to explain a little bit more about the agent policy violation because when i hear agent policy and kind of looking forward yeah. it's just like you you just like didn't sign something correctly or you didn't do something it's, it's paperwork it's it's more or less not even paperwork but it's just uh, administrative stuff not done properly. Sure, and that's definitely what it can sound like. Um, that's actually a separate category of complaints. So things like the uh, other complaints, the inaccurate plan uh, mm -hmm. benefit info, application errors, provider info. Mm -hmm. Agent policy violations really falls into two main categories. The biggest one usually is ready to sell issues, not being appointed in a state, not being certified for DSNP and then writing one. Mm -hmm. Things like that are the most common agent policy violations, but it also falls into things like cold calling or mm -hmm. impermissible cross-selling of mm -hmm. say a final expense product or an MA call or um, you know directly misleading them say you know calling about dental vision hearing when someone's asked about a med sub or Got asked it. about MA um, so it's all all comes down to kind of like make sure we're following that scope of appointment make sure you're talking about what everyone agreed to talk about and just knowing knowing those rules about cross-selling when you can and can't and what products. Got it. And so then the other complaints are just, again, inaccurate plan benefits, yep. not always malicious. Sometimes it's an honest mistake, yep. but just making sure that you're being extra careful. Application errors, that's something that I always thought hilarious because application errors actually delay the application. Yep. So when you have that 24 to 48 hour turnaround time, 
if it's a you know delaying or not signing that application makes that go beyond those hours and that i know is always a top uh, top complaint we get it absolutely is and you know that's something that luckily is really easy to remedy um mm -hmm. through a couple of things one if you're doing an e-app that makes it pretty hard sure. to screw up the application sure. not saying you couldn't key in a Medicare number wrong, select a wrong SEP code, something like that. But generally, you, if you do something that's going to really hold up the app, it's just not going to let you continue. Sure. So that helps a lot. If you are in a situation where you're doing a paper app, use our enrollment team. Send that mm -hmm. into SMS. If you're contracted with us, we can process those apps for all carriers you have with us. Um, our enrollment team is really good at mm -hmm. checking those ready to sell statuses, making sure you remember to sign the app, which sure. at least at one point was the number one thing mm -hmm. that caused apps to pen. The agent didn't sign it. So using those tools and resources that we have uh, can really cut down on those app issues. Sure. So let's go into, again, some non-CMS. We talked about CMS, Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, but when you take this this process and you take it virtual, there's a whole nother level of compliance that people advertising need yeah. to be aware of. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I just mentioned earlier the uh, Federal Trade Commission in reference to those Joe Namath ads. It's very similar. A lot of people look at the CMS. They may look at the Medicare Communication and Marketing Guidelines and think, okay, read it cover to cover, mm -hmm. backwards, forwards, upside down. I know what I can and can't do, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely not the only thing like you have to pay attention to. People need to realize that one, there are a lot of other laws that regulate the acts that we do as agents. Mm -hmm. TCPA, Telephone Consumer Protection Act, regulates marketing by phone. It's going to regulate do not call lists. It's going to regulate hours that you can call people. It's going to regulate what is a non-solicited phone call, mm -hmm. which may be a slightly different definition than yes, CMS. Sure, sure. So it's kind of looking at the intersection of all these regulations and seeing, okay, how can we be in compliance with all of them? And those are state regulations, correct? Because I know in some states it's different than others about when you can call, when you can't. Um, Absolutely. Even things like national uh, na or state, state of emergencies can affect those regulations. Absolutely. TCPA is kind of the federal baseline mm -hmm. um, that, that regulates that, but states can absolutely have their own do not call lists with specific regulations. They can prohibit calling on certain days. For example, I know a fun one is uh, Louisiana prohibits calling on Mardi Gras. Uh, <laughs> of course it does, why not? Yeah. So you know, <laughs> lots of little things like that mm -hmm. that can vary state to state. Um, and it really applies to all your other communications as well. Can spam that regulates email marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're marketing or in California, dealing with the California Consumer Protection Act, mm -hmm. that provides some additional opportunities for folks to find out what information you're collecting. Sure, sure. Um, and the big thing is state departments of insurance. Um, you know, this comes up a lot, especially when we talk about events and talk about limits to gifts. Mm -hmm. CMS obviously has that fifteen dollar per person limit for right. gifts and everything at an event. Make sure that lines up with your state. Those are the federal kind of minimum standards. Mm -hmm. Some states require no gifts whatsoever. Right. So we want to make sure you're following your DOI rules um, and staying within those as well. And the carriers. Mm -hmm. A lot of carriers have more specific, more stringent rules than CMS. And sure. I think that's the big thing for people to remember is at the end of the day, you're contracted with a carrier. You as an agent do not have a contract with CMS. Mm -hmm. That's not who you directly answer to. You mm -hmm. answer to the carriers you're contracted with. So, again, the carriers and, are the kind of the, the police officers in this case. Yeah. Absolutely they are. Absolutely they are. All right. So again, we talk about this a lot. What are some ways that people can kind of combat? Because again, at the end of the day, everybody on this webinar, all of our agents, they're not the ones who are the Joe Namans, they're not the, the bad apples that you're talking about. So what can we do to help protect ourselves while also serving our clients? Absolutely. So a lot of it is just really basic stuff that mm -hmm. in a lot of cases you're already doing if you were meeting someone face to face. Mm -hmm. It's just some of those extra steps, getting everything in writing, whether that's through email, faxing over, physically mailing, mm -hmm. the same things you would have with an in-person appointment, make sure that still gets to the client sure. in some form or fashion recording and retaining phone calls like we mentioned earlier making sure you can back up what that conversation looked like and the things you discussed mm -hmm. can be really really important and a lot of this is going to be made easier by having a good document management system mm. tons of folks that you know still have filing cabinets full of papers and yeah. if that's the way you want to live your life that's totally fine i get it 
Um, I don't mind paper myself, but back that up. Mm -hmm. Have it stored in an electronic format somewhere that you can access from anywhere in the country, maybe something cloud-based where even if you're on vacation, compliance doesn't care if you're on vacation. If yeah. UHC sends you an email saying respond by, mm -hmm. I don't really care where you are, that's the date. Sure. Um, in some cases you could request an extension or an exception, but generally you want vacation's to Vacation's not gonna do it. Yeah, <laughs> not, not in a lot of cases. Sure. Um, so wanna make sure that that document management system is up and running. So you, your staff can take care of anything that comes up. Sure. So follow-up process, how can a follow-up help avoid a complaint or a compliance violation? Well, so like we talked about earlier, a lot of complaints are just this administrative process mm -hmm. that was kind of initiated by a client calling 1-800-MEDICARE, right. a client calling a carrier, mm -hmm. a client calling your state DOI because they can't get a hold of somebody. Right, right, right. So all of those little things that maybe the client didn't intend to file a complaint, so having that good follow-up process, making sure you're setting that follow-up appointment, making sure they have an email to reach out to, mm -hmm. phone number, contact info in general, and just constantly engaging with them mm -hmm. is going to keep you front of mind and make sure that when they do have those questions, they know who to reach out to. Yeah. That way it doesn't trigger that complaint. Again, there, that does so much. Again, what we want to do is when people, we want your NA as an agency to be synopsis with insurance. We want you to do what Kleenex did to the facial tissue industry, chapstick to the uh, lip balm. And so we don't think, oh, I, I have a question, my insurance, call my insurance carrier. It's insurance, I call my agent. So that follow-up process, not only does it help you with those complaints, help you with that, but it solidifies that relationships, helps with referrals, helps with retention for sure. And then be ready for customer service. I think this one, I think um, we're getting to the age where we're getting better at this, but yeah. a lot of Medicare services are behind the scenes. We don't file sure. claims. We don't actually have to go door to door and collect premium anymore. Mm -hmm. So a lot of agents kind of got used to the, you know, the I enroll them and I move on. So what does customer service look like right now for an agent? I think a lot of the time it's just answering basic questions, mm -hmm. everything from co-pays, deductibles, drugs are the probably one of the biggest things, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, back to the complaint side, those uh, inaccurate plan and benefit information. Sure. If you're going to talk drugs, make sure you're explaining not just, oh, here's your co-pays, mm -hmm. but here's your co-pays in each stage of coverage. Sure. If that plan has a deductible, explaining what that looks like. Mm -hmm. If it's someone who's likely to go into a donut hole, explaining what that looks like. Got it. So those are probably some of the most common types of questions that clients may pose. And then every now and again, some of the a uh, little more elevated issues like, well, my doctor wants me to go on this drug, but it's not on the formulary. Mm -hmm. How do we file a formulary mm -hmm. exception? The doctor should absolutely know how to do that, but sometimes you'll get pulled into it. Sure. Um, another big one is network issues. Well, you told me my plan has hearing benefits. Mm -hmm. Where can I go to get hearing aids? Mm -hmm. Or, um, okay, I've got this, you know, healthy foods card. Mm -hmm. What stores can I use that at and what mm -hmm. can I buy with it? So basic questions like that, especially when it comes to those ancillary benefits, I think that's kind of a, not a pet peeve, I think a lot of it's just agents right. that uh, maybe don't understand all the details because sometimes they're hard to find. Mm -hmm. We really, really love to sell those ancillary benefits. Right. We're really bad at making sure clients utilize them. That's, really, that's a very good point. And just to keep in mind here, when we talk about compliance in general, we focus on compliance in relation to Medicare Advantage and prescription drug plans, sure. but these are amazing practices to have if you're writing a med sup, cancer insurance, final expense, this is something that, again, even if a complaint makes it to, if it's not an against, you know, the carrier, if a complaint makes it to the DOI, mm -hmm. this is all stuff that, again, builds loyalty, builds that um, referral base, but it's something to help protect you across your entire agency, not just in regards to CMD plans. So here's a question again, something where this, this whole webinar kind of stemmed from this question. And we actually had a situation recently yeah. where an agent basically, well, tell us a little bit about the situation. Obviously no names, no HIPAA information yeah. here, but why, what happened to an agent where this is kind of what comes to our mind when, when it comes to working clients sure. with phone? So unfortunately there's been a couple of these situations mm -hmm. recently with a little different details, but someone who actually has dementia mm -hmm. and picking up the phone, had a conversation, enrolled in a plan. A couple months later, they're going to the doctor and all of a sudden, hey, our insurance doesn't work anymore. None of our doctors are in network. Drugs cost astronomically more because they're not mm -hmm. on the formulary. Kind of a worst case scenario, yeah. absolutely. And 
mom has no idea what happened. Mm. Threw out the mail because she wasn't expecting a new insurance card. Mm -hmm. Don't even have a card for this new plan that they didn't know they were on. And it, it's really a bad situation all around. And a lot of it comes from, you know, how do you identify if a senior has that diminished capacity? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's something that we can come across, especially last year during the pandemic when everything was kind of locked down in mm -hmm. a lot of areas. People were lonely. They wanted to talk. They picked up the phone mm -hmm. because they were lonely. Well, a lot of times the, the seniors with the diminished um, capacity, they're the ones who were considered much more at risk. They yeah. were an unhealthy client. So they weren't, you know, before they may have had their kids there, may have had a caregiver there that they just weren't getting because of the pandemic. So Absolutely. these people were more alone and they didn't have the resources that they had to answer those questions. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, we see that time and again, you know, there was another case where someone who normally would not be of a diminished capacity, mm -hmm. but they had just had surgery, they were on some pretty heavy opioid painkillers, yeah. and did not remember the conversation at all, sure. had no clue what was going on. Yeah, that was me when I had my wisdom teeth removed. Yeah, I was talking, absolutely. I was you talking to my, I, w I was talking <laughs> to my radio and like yeah. having a full conversation. That's another time for another story. But so what can a person do to, to um, identify when is it that I'm sure. like, this call is A, not going anywhere or B, you know, could result in a complaint because they clearly don't know what's going on. So I think there's there's a few things to look for. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, you know, in this day and age, especially dealing with senior clients, looking for that, um, you know, my someone, spouse, child, somebody helps me with that. Mm -hmm. They handle all of this. Um, I know, again, if you've been in the industry a while, you'll say, well, that's just an objection. And yeah. that's where this gets really tricky. There's a really fine line between is this just an objection or is this a legitimate concern? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, for the safety of everyone involved, you as an agent, for the client, you kind of have to default to legitimate concern. You yeah. can't assume it's just an objection. Sure. Um, Very good you know, point. I think that's, you know, really being cautious of if they say, well, someone helps me with that, that can mean, oh, I just want to talk to my kids about this first, make sure I understand it. That could be, I have a power of attorney that has to make decisions for me and I sure. can't even legally sign this app. Sure. And if that client is in a position where they have a power of attorney, mm -hmm. they may not be in a state where they can adequately voice what that situation is like. And plus it can be kind of not, the word embarrassing is not the word that I want to use, but not everybody Absolutely. is super proud of the fact that they don't have control in their own, in that situation. Of course, especially someone that they just met two minutes ago over the phone. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So yep. better safe than sorry. So what does that mean? It's it's making sure that it, like you mentioned, if if there is a question in this demographic in this market, move on. I would say move on. Or if they do express that someone helps me with these things, mm -hmm. make sure that you are saying, well, can we get them on the phone? If mm -hmm. you want to proceed, I think that's the best way to approach it. Got it. Can we get them on the phone? Are they around? Can we reschedule this call? Something like that. It doesn't mean these folks don't need help and shouldn't be afforded the same opportunity of any of your other clients. There just may be some extra steps. Some extra steps. That's fair. It's it's. I like that. Like, let's press on, but on your terms. Let's press on. When can Absolutely. I call back? Are they available? Let's get this process going. Yeah. Awesome. So avoiding complaints. We've talked about this a little bit. We've hit on a lot of these, but again, let's let's stop the complaints before they even happen. How can I need yep. to do that? A lot of really basic things. Like I said, have that clear process. Make sure everything's easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Line out, here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we're going to do about it. Here's how it's going to happen. When you can expect the mail, what mm -hmm. to look out for. Mm -hmm. Setting All expectations. Of those basic things to set, to let them know exactly what's going to happen every step of the way. Make sure that you're doing that thorough plan review, going over the summary of benefits, looking at each aspect of the plan. Mm -hmm. If they have additional questions or something you need to look up, sure. follow up on those questions. Sure. And then just that after the sale follow up, calling in two weeks, make sure they got their cards, mm -hmm. three weeks, whatever the case may be. If it's AEP, make sure you call second week of January, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, but just doing that follow up and then regularly communicating throughout the year using um, the newsletters in our agent marketing portfolio or your own pieces to keep in front of those clients and make sure that they are keeping your name in front of them, your contact info in front of them to, again, avoid those unnecessary and sometimes unwitting complaints by calling Medicare or calling a carrier. So it seems just like good customer service. 
yeah, and just and making just sure you're the call. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, I think it's also, again, too, important to, to understand that even being a best agent, the best agents I've worked with have had complaints filed against them, either yep. no, people knowing or not knowing that. So just because you're a great agent doesn't mean that a complaint's not going to happen. What do you do if slash when you get a complaint with Medicare yeah, or you're... with the carrier? Yeah, and you're exactly right. It's still, to an extent, it's a law of large numbers. If you're in the business long enough and mm -hmm. write enough apps, you'll probably get a complaint at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but like I've said a couple of times, stay calm, you know, unless you know you did something wrong. Right. It's generally not a big deal. It's an administrative process. Once that, if it, if it went through Medicare and it's a CTM, a complaint to Medicare, mm -hmm. it gets back to the carrier they have a process that that has to go through. There sure. are no exceptions, no ifs, mm -hmm. ands, or buts. It has to go through their process. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, they're going to send you a questionnaire, uh, a lot of times called a request for agent response, mm -hmm. and it's going to go over the basics. How did you meet, get in touch with this client? Was it a lead? Was it a referral? Was it, you know, did they call you, mm -hmm. email, whatever? It's going to ask for your account of how the uh, appointment went maybe some specific questions depending on the type of complaint um, and then you're just going to provide that documentation provide that call recording provide that scope of appointment provide that uh, business reply card mm -hmm. whatever you have that's going to back up those questions the carriers asking of you and then in the case that you ever do uh, have kind of a substantiated claim most common with some of those ready to sell issues and things like that um, may have some remedial training that you have to go through or something along that line. Just making sure that you complete that in a really timely fashion. I think it's, it's important to note, again, you're going to be working directly with the carrier, not working with CMS. Yep. And the carriers don't want to get rid of their agents because they want agents to continue to write for them. So it's not so much I've worked with agents where like, I'm just going to ignore that. It'll go away. The complaint's not going to go away. And the longer you delay responding, the longer you delay them yep. getting this to them, you're working with human beings. It's going to make you look more guilty. Mm -hmm. So like you mentioned, stay calm, respond to them. Um, the best way to, to equate a compliance is like a traffic violation. Yep. Sometimes you get pulled over. It might just be warrant. If you're going five over or 10 over, maybe you'll get a ticket. Maybe you have to pay a fine. Maybe you'll you know, have to do some additional training on that. Most of the times it's just a warning. It's not a big deal. You can explain your case. Maybe you even realize it happened. But if you're going 99 miles an hour in a school zone, you're going to lose your license. So that's sure. what we're talking about. If you're threatening to break hips in exchange for signatures, this is not for you. This is simply the, you know, some of the most common complaints that we talked about and mentioned earlier. So that is talking about complaints. I've talked about compliance, especially in a virtual arena. But I think it's easy to say, there's not really a whole lot of difference between yeah. meeting with being a uh, compliance in a virtual world, be meeting a uh, compliance when you're face to face with somebody. What would be, you know, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, yeah, put them in there. there, toss them in there. Well, me and Shane will hang out for a little bit, but let me just ask you, what's the biggest difference compliance wise? Mm -hmm. What should, if somebody is taking, um, you know, going from I visit all my clients face to face to I'm going to start my virtual agency. What's the biggest difference in compliance that they need to be aware of? I think the biggest difference is if you're working strictly with new clients over the phone, mm -hmm. not having that relationship, not understanding that situation, and not having those nonverbal cues mm -hmm. during the discussion can result in those small mistakes. Got it. It's just, it, that's 90% that's of what these are, small mistakes, misunderstandings, you not understanding that the client didn't get it or mm -hmm. something like that. And a lot of that comes from we're used to, you know, 97% of communication is mm -hmm. nonverbal or 94, I think. Yeah. Um, but having being over the phone, that's not what we get. Sure. So having those call recordings, having those things that can back up mm -hmm. um, what you've been doing is going to be really helpful. It's just all about that communication. And we just have to be more clear and more uh, mindful of how we're communicating to folks when we don't have all those other non-verbal things to help with that communication. Sure. So the biggest way and the most thing again taking it from is non face to face to face to face is not just a compliance issue. It's a how do you build that relationship with the phone? Being clear, being concise, cut the creative stuff. That's this is no room for that. Yeah. Clear and concise will be creative every day of the week. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Um so Jim asked a great question and does or will SMS have a checklist for virtual sell, selling compliantly? Jim, I think that's a great idea. We're actually in the process of building a, a compliance white paper that lists the four 
top reasons for compliance violations. Yeah. In addition to that, how to combat that. Um, but we do also have a checklist where it's not necessarily a virtual checklist. It is on our AEP toolkit. So if you have a contract with senior marketing specialist, you can go to our website, click on our AEP toolkit, and we have a form. We know them in office as CYA forms, cover your assets. Uh, but their forms are called the Medicare Supplement or the Medicare Advantage Checklist. And it makes sure that you go through all this information with the client. The client can actually sign it at the end to make sure that you have gone everything, gone over everything that is required during a Medicare Advantage or PPP appointment. Absolutely. So we have that. Um, it's in that AEP toolkit. Yep. Melanie brought up a really good point uh, asking about call recordings and, mm. and we did not go over this. Um, jumped on late and have some may have missed something. Are call recordings legal as that regulated state by state? Mm -hmm. um, yes and yes. Um, so in, in all states, businesses are allowed to record phone calls. In certain states, certain disclosures may be required prior to the call. Mm -hmm. That is why I highly recommend if you're not already using a, a VoIP phone system, voice over IP phone system, mm -hmm. like a Ring Central, like an 8x8, like something like that. Mm -hmm. um, on a lot of cases, those phone systems are going to handle those proper disclosures for you. Um, but if you're trying to do it yourself or through some kind of third party app, absolutely want to look up those state by state regulations for what disclosures are required um, and again that's that's going to vary a little bit state by state so mm -hmm. generally best to if you're looking to make that investment in that type of software probably easier just to look at a new phone system mm -hmm. than try to integrate some third party app uh, that's just another thing for you to keep track of. And that disclosure is what you hear when you call any business. When you call senior marketing specialist, it, this call may be recorded for training and 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 for uh, quality and training purposes. Yes, absolutely. So, yes, great yeah. call. Great, great question. Any other questions in regards to just general compliance? Again, you guys, this yep. is senior marketing specialist compliance officer. So any questions about general compliance or again, any questions about making sure your agency is able to take on selling in 2022 AEP? And a lot of that will be virtual. Yep. A lot of it will. Beautiful. All right, guys, again, this, um, this webinar was recorded. So